and let me know when that's running. Chair, we're live now. Thank you for that, Stuart. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's meeting of the Greater Norwich Development Partnership, which is held virtually. So if I can ask you to um, adhere to the normal uh, guidelines around muting yourself when you're not speaking, should you want to speak, if you put your hand up and indicate, then I'll bring you in at, at the right time. Um, and we'll, we'll take it from there. So um, <clears throat> first item on the agenda is declarations of interest. Um, uh, I have uh, my standing declaration, which is actually on the bottom of page four. Um, does anyone want me to read it out or are you okay to go with that? Okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. So uh, that's my declaration. Um, just in my peculiar interest and uh, a secondary one. Um, are there any declarations of interest from anybody else that they want noted? Councillor Fuller, have a uh, declaration? Well, I'm not sure I do anymore because whilst I did have a piece of ground that was uh, in, in the plan, it's not been it's not been selected. I'm not unhappy about that, so I don't think there's any interest anymore on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that, John. Um, Barry, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come yeah, on? the same one. Uh, Sean, just the uh, a member of the Norfolk and uh, Norwich Agricultural Association. Okay, thank you. For oh, so, yeah, from my perspective, yeah, not that I think it's entirely relevant. But yeah, I've got one. As, I'm, I, I sit on that as well. Okay, thank you, John. Um, do you have any apologies for absence, James? Yes, Chairman, I have apologies from Councillor Clancy. Okay, thank you for that. Um, you have before you the minutes of the meeting of the 16th of December, starting on page four. I'll take those on block. Can I take those as being correct? Or does anyone want any changes, updates, amendments, deletions? No, you're quiet. So I'll take it they're okay. I'll sign those off if everybody's okay with that. Okay, I'll take those as, as okay. Are there any matters arising for anybody in there? No. Okay. Um, that takes us on then to item five, which is questions. Um, we have uh, four, I think it is four questions today. Um, so if I would ask Phil Morris to take us through the question. So over to you, Phil. Thank you, Chair. I shall read them out. We've had four questions. Um, the first from Mr. Brian Robinson. And the question is, my various queries on the housing numbers in the Reg 19 representations were not answered. And therefore I wish to submit the following question. The household projections between 2018 and 2038 as set out by the government in table 406 for the three districts of Great, Greater Norwich is 29,954. This figure is adjusted by separate local affordability adjustment for each district to give the housing need. This establishes the base figure of 40,541 for Greater Norwich for 2018 to 2038. The Reg 19 proposes further contingencies, buffers and windfalls to set a delivery target of 52,646 homes over this period which is 76% above the household projections. The reason given is to ensure sufficient homes are available to ensure growth targets. The council's response to main issues states, if the anticipated economic growth is not delivered, the homes above the housing need will not be delivered as there will, be, will not be a market for them. For which the 76% overall contingency of the household projections seems excessive. Also, the ratio of new jobs to homes since 2008-9, as the AMR figure, as the AMR figures, is 1 to 1.08, but that set out in Reg 19 is 1 to 1 1.5, meaning that there will be there, meaning that there will there, sorry, slightly garbled that is, meaning that there will be an overprovision based on historic evidence. Based on the previous ratio, 35,640 homes will be required for the 33,000 jobs over the 20 year period. 
It is acknowledged that market forces will prevail and past performance ratio of jobs and homes suggests a lower figure of homes is sufficient to meet the anticipated economic growth of jobs. What is the justification for this over-provision of homes? So the officer response is, the government standard methodology provides the base position and identifies a need of 40,541 homes in the planned period. Typically, some sites take longer to develop than envisaged and some planning permissions are not implemented. To ensure that housing needs are met in full and a steady supply of sites is available, the plan identifies at least 10% additional provision. Such provision provides replacement opportunities and choice to deliver on, on for, to ensure delivery of the 40,541 homes needed. It is not necessary, necessarily expected to be additional growth. In total, the GNLP identifies opportunities for 49,492 homes. The additional uplift within this total provides greater certainty of delivering need and also ensures that faster economic growth and a larger number of jobs in the trend-based target can be supported. This uplift will also address the possibility of higher levels of household growth, as indicated in the Office for National Statistics 2018 projections. Comparing the ratio of jobs to homes, sorry, full stop. Comparing the ratio of jobs to homes for different time periods is not necessarily a useful indicator, as it will be affected through time by demographic change, the performance of the local economy, and changes to work patterns such as commuting flows and home working. Second question is from Dr. Catherine Rowett. In Appendix 11A of the papers, the GNDP have responded to each submission on the Norwich Western Link Road that the Norwich Western Link is solely a Norfolk County Council infrastructure scheme. However, the NWL is included in the plan in these places in the Regulation 19 draft plan. Section 3, the vision and objectives for Greater Norwich at paragraph 138, in brackets, quote, by 2038, our transport system will include the Norwich Western Link, close quote. At paragraph 243, strategic improvements in, in policy 4 include the Norwich Western Link, and under policy 4 on page 81, delivery of the Norwich Western Link Road. If the Norwich Western Link is solely an NCC project, Will the GNDP remove all the above references to the NWL from the plan? And if not, why not? The officer responds, the Norwich Western Link is not an allocation of the GNLP. The plan recognises the scheme as part of a wide ranging package of proposed strategic transport improvements provided by a range of bodies with transport responsibilities. These also include trunk road schemes and rail enhancements. It is appropriate to identify such schemes and proposals in the local plan as they affect the strategic context for growth and development. The NWL would be delivered by Norfolk County Council as the NWL progresses to a preliminary design for which planning permission and statutory orders can be sought. It would be assessed through the planning application process. An application for planning permission for the NWL will be determined in accordance with the development plan prevailing at the time and the environmental effects of the NWL will be assessed against the relevant legislative and regulatory requirements and against the policies contained in the GNLP if adopted, including the environmental policies contained in policy three, environmental protection and enhancement, together with all other material considerations. David Pett stopped the Wensum Link campaign, asked a very similar question, um, but also asked about legal advice. And the officer response is as to the answer to Dr. Catherine Rowett, plus it is not considered that the references to the Nor Norwich Western Link in the GNLP raise any legal risks to the plan. The final question is from Dr. Andrew Boswell, uh, Climate Emergency Planning and Policy. In September 2019, climate lawyers, cl Client Earth, who litigate in the UK and around the world, wrote to the Greater Norwich Planning Authorities about the need to integrate carbon emissions reduction objectives throughout the GNLP local plan policies. This was followed by Client Earth consultation responses at Regulation 18C in March 2020 and Regulation 19, 22nd of March 2021. The Regulation 19 response noted, none of the issues raised in our response to the Regulation 18 consultation appears to have been addressed and found the plan unsound and not legally compliant. 
In response, Appendix 11A of the papers, page 420, GNDP have responded. The GNLP conforms to, to legislation and national planning policy and guidance and, subject to the above, has had regard to climate change issues. Will the GNDP chair share with the GNDP board the legal advice which GNDP has taken on the above so that members are fully aware of the legal risks involved before agreeing a recommendation one that the Greater Norwich local plan is sound and to submit the plan to the Secretary of State for independent examination? The officer responds, the objectors have given their opinion that the plan is unsound and not legally compliant. It is for the planning inspector to assess whether this is the case. Having reviewed the relevant legislative and policy requirements, we are comfortable that the GNLP has been, proper, has been positively prepared to address climate change within the proper legislative framework and that the plan does, does what we are legally required to do. This is reflected in our statement on climate change in section four of the GNLP. In addition, we're confident that the plan expresses some quite ambitious objectives about how land use can contribute to delivering improvements in our carbon performance. And that's the end of the questions. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for taking us through those, the questions and the answers, and those will be included in the the minutes of this meeting going forward. So thank you again for that. That moves us on then to item six, which is the submission of the Greater Norwich Local Plan, um, which starts at page 13 and has four recommendations for us to work our way through. So Graham, I believe you're presenting on this one for us. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. I'll take you through this. Uh, clearly, it's the main paper on the on the agenda for this afternoon's discussion. And we've reached a really very important stage in plan preparation by presenting this to you, which is the first time this is this has hit the public domain in this way. Um, just before I kick into the report, I just think we ought to just recap, because I know whilst most of the members on the call are familiar faces who I know have been with us with this long journey, I'm aware that some, some are new members and haven't been through us all the way. Uh, and I'm also aware that to make this understandable for the public, there may be some degree of context needed. Um, and just, just to way as a reminder, a background of where we've come from, it was actually back in 2015 that the partnership, which itself isn't quite long standing, having originally been formed in 2007 and then prepared the previous joint core strategy um, in the run up to 2012 when it was finally adopted, um, the partnership decided it was going to try and um, repair the produce the replacement for the joint core strategy because plans eventually need need replacing the joint core strategy provided guidance up to 2026 there was a need to roll that forward incorporate the successes that we'd had reflect up-to-date information and we decided to do it by producing not just a joint core strategy but a greater Norwich local plan that was a longer more convoluted document insofar as it jointly dealt with not only the strategic approaches and the policies that we were going to commonly apply across the Greater Norwich area, but it was also going to deal with um, the, the sort of certainly all the significant scale sites that involved in delivering that growth need that you'd then calculated. So it was a really major undertaking. We collectively undertook to commence back in 2015, and we did it through firstly a uh, major interrogation around needs and sites through a comprehensive call for sites exercise that took place in spring summer of 2016. Um, we then did we then did a formal consultation in uh, early 2018 around growth options site proposals. We followed that for with further consultation at the back end of 2018 around further new revised and small sites. And that culminated in a full draft version of the plan that was consulted on in between January and March 2020. As you can see it's not necessarily quick to get through these things. 
and that's because of the, both the scale of the geography of the area that we're dealing with, the how controversial sites proposals are, and and the number of sites and the people that are engaged with it. Throughout that process, what we've generally seen is as the plan has taken shape in response to changes in government guidance, but crucially the engagement that we've had through the development industry with communities, with interest groups, whatever, generally the level of concern representation that we've seen expressed at each of those stages has tended to diminish through the process and um, well, we, what we did is back in uh, effectively September last year, we looked at the timetables where we were and particularly things with announcements about forthcoming government changes to the planning system. And we decided we were going to move to the regulation 19 stage, which is what we're uh, reporting the feedback from you today. The key difference between those all those stages that I've referred to previously is we are very much in listening mode at that stage. The plan isn't set in stone in any way, shape or form. We are actually engaging with people to positively shape it. So every stage you received reps, they've been analysed. We've thought through whether we need to change the plan. Under Regulation 19 that we brought forward uh, in February this year, it's a slightly different nature of a beast because you are consulting on your general set and your legal compliance. Um, so you've effectively prepared a plan, your scope to change it in advance of possible submission and examination is limited by the regs. So it's not a case of examining each representation who and thinking whether you can actually approve the plan. The task we have to do at this stage is analyze those representations and work out whether we have any issues of legal compliance or issues of general soundness that would lead us to conclude that we all the, either ought to consult further before submitting or not to submit because we think we've got some uh, failure in the process. So it's a slightly different thing. And I know certainly from my experience in the planning process, some members find this slightly counterintuitive in the process because you've consulted and there might be things that people have suggested at this stage that you think actually it's a worthwhile suggestion, but we are limited in terms of the changes we can make to the plan by the process. So I just want to be clear, that's the issue that we're considering here is soundness. The other point I just want to reflect on before I get into the report and what's actually the consideration of the reps and whether we're recommending to submit or not submit is just reflect back on the decision that the board took in September last year. We were contemplating whether to um, consult further under Regulation 18, particularly around transport matters uh, and issues associated with the Western Link and one or two other things. So, we, uh, and we decided not to do a further consultation on those matters, principally because of the emerging government guidance about the forthcoming planning white paper, etc. Um, and a deadline that the government has given us that we need to have a, a revised adopted plan in place by the end of 20, 2023. And there's significant strategic risks for all of the authorities collectively if we fail to hit that deadline and don't have an up-to-date plan in place by that stage. So we took that decision back in, I think it was September, we had a couple of meetings over last summer to lay the ground to it and went straight to Regulation 19 stage. Clearly there's quite a lot of water passed under the bridge and that continues to change in terms of government announcements, but certainly my reflection on it is that the decision that the board took in September last year was very much the right one to keep us on track for December. I, I, the, clearly there has been a delay in the publication of details following the initial white paper on planning matters and, th and recent, uh, recent events such as the Amersham by-election may yet influence that further, but we have certainty on the process that we're running through in this case, and that's a major advantage. And certainly we would not be able to make progress under any new style plan at this stage. So it looks like it's very much the right decision the board made to, in order to manage the collective risks that we have around not having a plan in place. So from that point of view, I think that's, that takes us up to where we are. Um, now, the consultation uh, around the Reg 19 stages, soundness and legal compliance took place in February and March. 
uh, this year, we got 1,316 representations overall. There's a breakdown in Appendix A of your papers today about where those, where those numbers lie and how many representations in terms of support objections and which bit of the plan and which sites they relate to. But overall, bearing in mind we are talking about a really significant plan that covers a large geographical area, many different allocations and, you know, significant and long, long reaching strategic policies. Those overall numbers, whilst they seem high, are not untoward and they are considerably reduced from the scale of objection and concern that we had raised by our communities at the earlier stages. And there is a degree of inevitability about some degree of objection, because you will find in some instance, we will have developers saying we've undercooked the numbers, we'll have preservation organisations saying we've overcooked the numbers and we're sitting in the middle. You are never going to be able to reach this plan with having no objections to it um, that you've got. So the paper before you summarises what those objections are at a quite high level. I'll bring your attention to particularly table two, uh, which sets out over about six pages from pages 19 to 25 of your agenda papers, the main issues that have been raised in terms of soundness and legal compliance and an initial sort of officer response to those things, hopefully demonstrating confidence that we are in a position where we think we are legally robust and sound and can submit. That follows through in terms of the paper and then which flags up, I think, specifically two issues which I'll address to you in their slide slightly different categories of issues, because the first issue that we think you definitely need to consider and address before submission is the one that is whether we're compliant with the duty to cooperate. Uh, as you know, not just is the example of the partnership working with three, three districts and one county and the Broads Authority, a really good example of the duty to cooperate working. But across the county, we also have a county-wide um, member forum that meets to address the duty to cooperate. We engage with all the statutory undertakers. We engage across the boundaries. We've got a really good track record of, of cooperating amongst all the organisations that you need to cooperate with. The issue that we have at the moment is that we have one of those organisations who is, was raising concerns over the plan and its implementation in the absence of an agreed scheme to mitigate some of the harm to the protected wildlife sites that surround um, in, in and around that's, that are, some of them are within our areas, some are outside of our areas, but would cause would arise from visitor pressure associated with the growth. Now, that's a particular concern because if we are found not to have properly cooperated, an inspector has no choice but to find the entire plan and sound and revert matters back for us to sort out. If you fail the duty to cooperate, you failed your plan. Um, so the, the report before you says, in order to proceed, we really need this statement of common ground with Natural England about how those matters are to be resolved. Uh, and there's been quite a lot of work on this in the past. Technical reports produced, package of mitigation measures come forward with. Over, this is quite a rapidly moving area, but over recent days, we've carried on those discussions with Natural England. And we're now in a position where we have seen a copy of a statement of common ground that we believe is capable of being signed off both by Natural England and by all the councils. I can't say that has been signed as we sit here, but that's certainly the intention over the coming days as we move through the sign off process. So having raised that issue with you that we thought we potentially had an issue that needs to address, it is now looking very positive that we will be able to demonstrate that we've positively addressed that issue before this goes on following this meeting for consideration at individual cabinets. So that's the first sort of relatively bit of good news. 
The other point that's raised as a concern about our own soundness is, is in relation to gypsies and travellers. We have quite an extensive evidence base on gypsies and travellers, and notwithstanding the fact we've consulted on a number of occasions, gone through any number of reasonable steps to try and identify sites for inclusion in the plan, we have an evidence base that tells us we ought to be identifying X many sites, and we are short of that target. Um, We've taken advice on the severity and the significance of this issue, and the advice is this doesn't immediately render your plan unsound, unable to proceed, and the advice is we carry on and proceed with it. But as things stand, we would expect to have a very tough ride at the examination because of the absence of identified sites to meet identified needs for gypsies and travellers in the plan. So the second recommendation is that we don't wait to hit problems at the examination when the inspector asks questions about this issue. We actually commit to undertake work to identify those sites, work out how they are going to be delivered, how we're going to demonstrate meeting the needs now. If we don't address that need now and address that in some urgency, I'm afraid it's likely that we will hit some at least a cause for delay in producing the plan that we're seeking to get adopted. So that's the second recommendation that we've got for you uh, today. The other, the other two recommendations are more procedural in nature in that they are seeking your agreement. And this would again need to feed into the recommendations that you make to the individual cabinets here is that we agree to that the plan is sound, proceed to submit it, but agree that we request the inspector who's going to be appointed by the Secretary of State has the power to make main modifications that they may consider to be necessary to make the plan sound and legally compliant. That isn't necessarily ceding um, all that authority to the inspector. In practice, there is no choice about whether to do it because if you don't give the power to the inspector to do those things, what you have is an inspector who needs to approve the plan as it stands or find you unsound. Um, effectively, we know there are certain things that will need to be changed, certain modifications will need to be made to the plan, so there will need to be some degree of change, so that's an inevitability. The comfort that you all have is that after that main modification process, this all comes back to individual councils for formal consideration of whether you're happy with those changes, whether you're prepared to adopt the plan. It's still individual councils need to adopt the plan at the end of the process. And the fourth and final recommendations, where I will shut up in a moment, try and answer any questions and take a breath, is that we're asking for authority to be delegated. And again, this will be delegated through each of the individual councils as appropriate to um, agree the minor modifications that we can. Those are things not of great substance. They won't affect the policies. They won't introduce new or different allocations. They'll just update text, correct errors that are there, make the plan more readable, etc. Uh, so we're asking powers to make those which we'll need as part of the examination in process and also to negotiate with the inspector and objectors that those possible main modifications I spoke about as a moment ago. So um, just before I shut up, I would um, just like to go on record as thanking the Joint Officer team who work behind the scenes to process this. They've done a huge amount of work right through the COVID period uh, and particularly to analyse all those 1300 representations, take legal advice, update the information base and satisfy themselves that we're in a position to proceed. So so that's where we are at. We think there's, it's not without risk. There are issues we will need to do. There will be yeah, many, a, many an issue we'll need to fight, uh, fight and consider during the examination, but they've covered a huge amount of work of analysis. I hope you find the report readable. Uh, and between myself and the members of the team who are in the call, if you've got any questions, any issues you want to raise, happy to try and answer any questions. Okay, thank, thank you for that, Graham. That's uh, to taking us through the four recommendations and the, the context and, and bringing us up to date on where we are. Um, okay, so are there any 
questions relating to the recommendations or the content of the report, I've got John. John, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'm happy to go first. Um, yeah, first of all, insofar as Duty Corporate is concerned, I can confirm as chairman of the Duty Corporate Board, which comprises all uh, eight local planning authorities plus the county, that we are, this is, no, this is not just lip service, we actively uh, cooperate and examine all the issues. At our most recent meeting, we had the regional, um, I'm going to call him a director, but I think he's a senior manager of UK Power Networks, outlining how there's a whole approach to power uh, provision and including, and we had the opportunity to work with him to reinforce you know, where our strategic growth sites were and to satisfy ourselves that actually, yes, so it's where we're planning growth, so, so are UK Power Networks. At a previous meeting, we had Robin, I can't remember his surname, from, UK, from the Water Resources East, and guess what? Where we said the plat the growth was, so were uh, um, Anglian Waters, and and they but the, equally they consulted with us on things like uh, winter storage of water and things like that. So I think the duty cooperate isn't just working; we can demonstrate it to be working, and I have no doubt that on that soundness point we are compliant there. Um, insofar as the green infrastructure point, I think we've we've got a common ground there, and I'm pleased that we've been able to come to an accommodation with Natural England. Uh, I think we've, I would characterise what we've done so far with them as a sort of a, a step one, which is assess the problem and to get a quantum of the resource that's required. But I think it's common ground on all of us that we now need to bolster that with governance, measurement of success factors, clarity of approach, and actually be really clear about how much you know, we need to do in each area so that it's proportionate to growth. So commitment to a, a review um, and implementation of that, I think, is a good point, and we can move for, forward on that point. I notice in the report there's quite a lot of stuff, noise really, I suppose, about the village clusters in South Norfolk. I think just for the record, it would be useful to say that we have, this is not just some pie in the sky pipe tree. We are currently out to Reg 18 uh, consultation on this. This is a real process. Over 400 sites have been considered for about 120 parishes. 70 or so sites are now preferred and there's a further 15 or 20 reasonable alternatives. Um, I notice in the report, there's an issue, well, what about self and custom build? Let's not forget that in this plan uh, for, the, for the whole GNDP area, we're considering three or five, depending on the size, uh, self build properties in each parish. And collectively that and our village clusters is delivering something like only seven to 8% of the total housing load. This is proportionate. It's not, over, it's not overdoing it by any means. And given that this area contains 30% of the population, we're still not denying the gravitational pull of Norwich. Uh, finally, if I may, uh, insofar as Gypsies and Travellers is concerned, I've, I think we, we are going to have to pick up the baton on this in a more demonstrative way. But my, my, my preference, I think, and I'm happy to have a debate on this, is that rather than just go straight for sides and almost have a degree of randomness about it, we should take the, the tried and tested principles that you know, let's work out where the need is and have a, a directional apportionment between the authorities first, you know, possibly in proportion to the housing numbers for the general population. So at least we've got a starting point. Um, we can't end up with a moral hazard situation where just because uh, people put their shoulder to wheel in the past means they then have to take uh, an unfair share of the burden going forward. So I think um, uh, we're probably going to have to do a little bit more assessment work on that. But an apportionment stage, which is how we do the local plan, and I've been involved for two and a half of them now, uh, uh, and, and then that enables us to focus the minds in a more equitable manner. But yeah, I'm happy with all the recommendations, but subject to that sort of a little bit of process around the gypsy and travel issue, I think we've got a sound plan, which we can be proud of, that is proportionate, it is evolutionary, and actually, importantly, lays the groundwork for the next plan so that we can have a, a real choice as to whether A, we wish to start to embark on a new settlement or not. And that, that's work that isn't 10 minutes sort of work. We need two or three years just to work out whether it's a runner. And I'm delighted that we're, we're, we're gra sort of grabbing the bulls by the horns on that in good time without necessarily prejudicing those who follow on behind us. Thank you, John. And thank you for um, going through the elements of the duty to cooperate that's uh useful to have those on record um, and, and the good work that uh, has been done um, through your committee there is is, is, is uh, recognised across uh, Norfolk. So that's, uh, thank you for that. Um, can I take it you're happy to propose those uh, four recommendations? Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I've got Lisa next, followed by Mike. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it was um, another question regarding the duty to cooperate um, and the discussions, um, Grant, that you mentioned with um, Natural England, which you're now saying looks positive and um, should be able to, to sign, sign it off and what have you. I just wondered if... Um, the discussions Natural England had, obviously, I presume, concerns with the local plan. Was there anything that um, we needed to change or what was it that Natural England wanted, if you see what I mean? Just a bit more detail on that. Okay, th thank you for that, Lisa. Is that with you, Graham, or is that with you, Phil? Do you want me to just, just respond to that? Because it wasn't, it was a duty to cooperate issue that didn't necessarily relate necessarily to a concern with the policy that existed in the plan. Their concern was about the mechanism to give effect to that policy that they say is necessary to have in place from an early date. And it's the timing and the nature of that mitigation package and how that's going to work was their nature of their concern and that's what the what's what that's what this statement of common ground that we hopefully are on the verge of agreeing with natural england and formally signing off covers so it's it's not they weren't saying that there was a particular problem with the plan it was just they were exerting a degree of pressure going unless you've got a mechanism in place to address that issue now you're planning for a level of growth that we think may cause impacts we're not happy with assuming that the statement of common ground gets sound, is, is, is happy and is found sound, et cetera, that, that sorts the issue to my mind. It doesn't require any amendment to the plan itself. Okay, thank you, Graham. And of course, if I may just jump in on that, um, Sean, it wasn't just Natural England that were expressing concerns. I think the members were expressing concerns about the, the robustness of the approach uh, taken by Natural England and questioning whether the action plan, as it in draft, and I think it's been it's been quite a it's been a valuable exercise to get the quantum of work needed, but the the, the detail lacked sort of a huge amount of rigor, and even the QC Simon Bird who reviewed of it said, well, there's no measurement of outcomes here. So I think it's the members who have actually said, yeah, okay, good as far as it goes, but we're not interested in second best. We need to take it further, and that, I understand the duty to cooperate statement now is a commitment to that review, and that's to be welcomed. Uh, thank, thank you, John. And yeah, that's, that's my understanding also is is that uh, the duty to cooperate statement now picks up those pieces. And thank you, Graham, for clarifying um, those aspects for Lisa. Okay, Mike, you wanted to come in? Thank you, Sean. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, just to say that the City Council has a sustainable development panel, cross-party um, uh, advisory body to um, Cabinet, uh, that looks at, um, well, sustainability issues. So clearly it's uh, uh, in terms of planning. And so clearly it's looked at this and um, it did ex express some concerns. There are certainly no deal breakers here, but this is what it will be pretty much uh, saying to um, to cabinet. Um, I mean, there was concern about gypsy and traveler sites um, and a question about whether or not um, at the moment there's a commitment to doing more work, but at what point there would be clarification of time scales and outcomes for that that further work, um, as I say, not a deal breaker. Um, the discussions with Natural uh, England about protected habitats um, was a concern. Pleasing to know now that that has been resolved and that uh, there'll be a further review as discussed by the um, duty to cooperate forum. That's really, really good, good news. They also raised concerns about um, the environment, environment agency's concerns around water resources, although there is a lot of reassurance around about that but they're, go they're going to be looking for more information on that going going forward uh, and then the final point was around the different approaches in the city in Broadland and South Norfolk to the housing allocation issue and whether or not there was still a risk of uh, the plan being found unsound because of that or whether we are um, we're, we're sure that that's a slightly different approach in those different locations is is, is sound and isn't going to trip us up. Okay, thank, thank you, Mike, for sharing uh, the outcomes of uh, your, your cross-party committees. That's, uh, again, useful to, to know and see. Um, okay, are there any other questions? Alan, do you want to come in? 
yes, really, just to just to say that um, I'm uh, happy with the recommendations. Uh, as as Mike says, there's no no deal breakers uh, here, and it's going to be important to get um, you know this this uh, as it were endorsed today by all of us, and then to take it obviously through our our committee, our, our cabinets uh, in due course to meet the, um, the, the the deadline that we anticipate that we we need to. Uh, take it to. I suppose the only the only point I would just just make is, which may be a, um, a a point of sort of emphasis, and it's in recommendation two about sufficient gypsy and traveller sites um, to meet identified needs, uh, and I think that's crucial wording because uh, this is a, a community of of residents who who live in the Greater Norwich area, and in the same way that we are working, you know, very hard to meet the needs. Uh, of, of, of every community um, uh, and every interest, as far as we're able to within this process, then that that that, that applies also equally to um, gypsy and, and traveller communities. Okay, th thank you, Alan, for uh, going through that. Uh, John, you wanted to come back? Yes, in? and just to follow on from that, and I wasn't planning to speak, but uh, as Alan has raised the issue, I'd like to place on record that South Norfolk is investing a six-figure sum, considerable sum, in uh, enhancing our Gypsy and Traveller uh, transit site in South Norfolk, uh, not far away from the Norfolk showground. Of course, the police sometimes are on the front line of this, but they only have powers uh, to move encampments on within the district. I just want to place on record our willingness in South Norfolk to come to agreements with uh, the, the two other authorities outside our district um, to say, well, yes, we can make this available. Clearly, sometimes if there's an encampment, sometimes there's a cost. I mean, that, that cost is going to have to be uh, met somehow. Um, but to come to an agreement, not just on permanent uh, sites, but also on, on, on transit sites. And I think that that would be a good um, that would be a good thing to do, and um, that's part of that's part of of the plan. So an ag an, ag an agreement, <coughs> including indemnities, uh, to make that site available, I think would would be welcome to everybody really, because sometimes when there are illegal encampments by the side of the road, um, there's a huge amount of resident pressure, and it's not fair on the people in encampments, and it's not fair on residents either. And so if there is a solution. Let's work together to, to, to deliver it on terms. Okay, th thank thank you for that, John. Yeah, I think you you're right. That needs to be picked up as part of the work and activity under that will come forward from recommendation two as that moves forward. Um, not understanding sites, but also understanding the um, nature of transit sites as well, and where best to have those or making use of what we've got and how that can be shared. So. Uh, Thank you for that. Okay, uh, can't see any other hands, anyone else wanting to speak? So we have the four recommendations before us. Um, can we just take a show of hands for all those in favor? Okay, that looks like most hands are up. Are there, be unanimous, Chairman. are there any hands that are against? No, nope, I can't see any hands again. So we'll take that as that one moves forward. So thank you everybody for that. Um, that moves us on then to page 65, um, which is the second report before us around the submission arrangements and the communication plan. I think this is with you again, Graham. I'm afraid so, but I will keep this. You will be relieved to know I will keep the presentation for this paper far, far shorter than the last one, uh, insofar as, um, yes, what this paper just is effectively provides a reminder of the comms plan and just makes out the details of actually what formally needs to be submitted. So is of assistance with the councils and their, their reports that, uh, that need to be prepared to actually get the, uh, get the plan uh, adopted by or endorsed by the cabinets prior to submission. Uh, if there's any queries on any part of it, I will, of course, uh, try to answer any questions. Okay, so thank, thank you for that, Graeme. Um, yeah, so this is the, the approach that we will all take around the communication um, as we move forward. Uh, John, you've got your hand up. Did you have a question?
Sorry, John, I can't hear you. Hello, John, did you have a question? Sorry, you've got your hand up. No, okay, sorry, it's a legacy hand. Okay, um, so any questions from anybody else around the approach we take? No, okay, so the recommendation is there. Again, can just have a show of hands for all those in favor? Okay, that pretty much looks everyone, yeah, James. Nice. Anyone against? No. Okay. Good. We'll take that one. Thank you, James. Okay, so that moves us on then to the Transport Fund Norwich Strategy Review, um, starting at page 74. And I think, Matt, you're taking us through this one. So if I hand over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, I'll be brief uh, in terms of my introduction, but I will give you perhaps uh, a little bit of background. Um, the, re the report uh, before you um, provides, uh, provides board with an update progress in terms of the review of the, the existing transport strategy for the Norwich area. Um, and I guess without having to say too much more, uh, the current strategy was first adopted in 2004. It has had some subsequent tweaks, but uh, it's fair to say that there's been a, a long held aspiration to be able to bring forward uh, the update. Uh, the manner in which that's being done, um, we have sought um, uh, a review in relation to governance, uh, and that will focus around the Transforming Cities Joint Committee. Um, and during those discussions, um, it, we, we sought advice from our partners and it was suggested that we might like to bring progress reports to the uh, GNDP board. Um, this is the first of those updates uh, and it's very much a question of um, the scoping work that's been undertaken um, once, um, uh, once we got uh, the, the project underway. Uh, and that's very much centred on the creation of uh, an officer working group with representation from all of the local authority stakeholders. Uh, one of the first things that um, uh, that group had to do uh, was to wrestle, wrestle with key themes, um, but, but also um, uh, what was uh, acknowledged to be uh, a relatively uh, ambitious um, um, program in terms of bringing forward the um, uh, bringing forward the initial policy review in relation to the uh, the strategy itself. Um, th that is quite challenging. Uh, we're looking to bring forward uh, uh, a review of the existing strategy by the year, roughly in line with the end of this calendar year, um, which will lead us to uh, the programme which is identified at, at section five, um, which is uh, already underway. Um, the reason we don't have the uh, the strategy or a draft version of it to share with you at this moment in time uh, is is as I've just indicated. Uh, a lot of this is is very fast moving, um, but it does involve um, significant discussion with with all of the local authority partners. Uh, work has commenced uh, on um, what would be a draft strategy for public consultation. Um, and consultation is planned for later in the summer. Um, the request is to, uh, uh, once we've undertaken the consultation and we've received feedback, would be to bring it back to GNDP uh, for further consideration and input. Um, in, in relation to the composition uh, of the um, of the strategy review, it will have three outputs. Uh, the first is, as I've said, the uh, the new transport for Norwich strategy. Um, following on from that adoption, we'll be looking at uh, next year at the action plan to support and accompany the strategy. Um, and, and the final strand is the sustainability appraisal report. Um, why are we doing this now? Some of what I've already highlighted in terms of time time frames. Um, but certainly there's an awful lot of things in terms of the emerging policy themes for the strategy. Uh, they are contained within the report under 
7.2. Um, uh, it relates to the uh, some of the emerging objectives around the local transport plan four, uh, which is in the final throes of its adoption, um, a zero carbon future, uh, improving air quality, changing attitudes and behaviours towards transport, supporting growth areas, meeting local needs, uh, uh, reducing the dominance of traffic uh, and making the transport system work as one. Um, there are also other key themes in terms of the need to up Data our strategy to align it better with government and opportunities for subsequent funding. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to say too much more other than um, in, in relation to the strategy uh, and the consultation which will happen in the summer, there will be a series of accompanying member workshops um, which will take place a, a, alongside that process. Um, the report author uh, uh, Richard Dolman uh, is present in the room, uh, as it were, uh, and myself, more than happy to take uh, any questions. Okay, th thank you, Matt, for taking us through that. Um, Mike, you have a question? Uh, yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, so just a couple of points. First of all, uh, a question about uh, the uh, Transforming Cities uh, Joint Committee and, um, and, and the discussions which are taking place around governance going forward, particularly in terms of the development and the implementation of the, the transport strategy. Um, because, I mean, in terms of, um, for, for the Greater Norwich area or the Norwich policy area, in terms of um, joint committees where you've got representation from the county and the districts, um, there is only um, that committee, the Transforming Cities Committee. Um, clearly, it's a decision making committee in terms of transforming cities issues, which we greatly ap ap appreciate. Um, but I'm just wondering for the future beyond, beyond those projects, which are transforming cities projects, um, which are therefore subject to that committee for further developments, implementation of, 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 of transport policy and strategy uh, in the Greater Norwich area, where those discussions are at and whether there will be any opportunity for the, the districts and the county to, to work together in the same way as we do on transforming cities and indeed the county and the city used to, used to on, on NHAC. And then the other thing I wanted to raise was around paragraph 7.2 and th thank you for going through that. Um, just seems to, I, I, I don't know how much more work is going to be done on um, those um, emerging policy themes. They are very, very high level and general at the moment is, is the first thing I'd say. So presumably that they will become more specific um, as work continues. But also in terms of some of the things which are driving um, all of this work, um, I mean, clearly it, it is about having a cohesive, coherent transport system that works, works as one and meets needs, all of those things. But the first uh, or the second bullet point, a zero carbon future, and I guess maybe the second one, the third one, improved in quality of our air, but certainly the zero carbon future seems to me should be overarching. I mean, we really, really need to be um, pursuing that and, 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 and also tying it in with our, um, our, our commitments and, and, and the requirements of central government policy for us to reduce um, CO2 levels. Um, so I, I would argue for a really prominent place in the, in the strategy um, for that, for carbon reduction and um, for clear targets and milestones and timescales and so forth. Okay, I'll, so I'll, I'll, thank, thank you for that, Mike. Matt, do you want to pick up thank, those two elements? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think um, the, the, the first point, I think, is acknowledged. Um, what we've looked to do is to try and find the most appropriate home for now. Um, we've, we've taken a paper through our own cabinet to look to review and change the terms of reference in relation to the joint committee. Um, but I think there is a discussion to be had uh, particularly the other side of the adoption of the overarching strategy as to uh, uh, as, as to whether or not um, um, that governance structure is truly fit for purpose. Uh, and, and that's a discussion that obviously we can have whilst we're looking to, uh, to pull together uh, the proposals um, and, and deliver on the timeframes that we're all committed to. Um, in terms of the second point, I'd agree with you entirely. Um, the work of the officer group uh, is pulling together the detail that sits behind those key themes. 
Um, uh, and I think that will be very important to be able to articulate that, that we have uh, a, a collective agreement uh, that the existing strategy is, is in need of a refresh, a, a fundamental revisit, uh, I, I guess I would argue, um, and that some of those themes uh, perhaps will end up being prioritised. Uh, that work is ongoing. Um, I came from a meeting this morning where uh, we're starting to look to put the meat on the bones to a point where um, I, I would hope very quickly uh, that we have the opportunity to be able to coalesce um, uh, uh, around a consultation document which starts to ask all of the right questions. Um, I think we all understand that, that transport is, a, is an emotive subject. Uh, it impacts on everybody's life um, and, and yet it's multifold. It plays a, a, an awful lot of different functions um, and it's not simply about um, uh, how we look to move forward in terms of specific policies in urban areas. Uh, uh, Norwich as a destination is incredibly important for, for a whole host of reasons to an awful lot of people, um, and, and that extends well out into the hinterland. So the, the geography uh, of, of the strategy, it was incredibly important, and that's something that we've spent a good deal of time um, looking to try and nail down so that we're not just looking at uh, urban trips, we're not just looking at opportunities to be able to get modal shift uh, and, and, and shorter distance journeys away from, away from the private car. We're also looking at how we can best support uh, sustainable growth, which is happening in all of our key growth locations, some, some of which are in more challenging locations. And I guess we kind of acknowledge that we need um, um, a, a hybrid approach in terms of um, um, it's not simply going to be about walking or cycling. Uh, we need to be able to focus on how we recover from the pandemic. Bus back better is incredibly important. And, and I think that, um, uh, that there's a consensus within the office of, uh, a return to uh, full and proper use of public transport for example so that work is happening uh, and certainly in relation to those key themes um, the paper was was written some weeks ago now uh, and we've seen some significant progress since that point in time okay thank thank, thank you for that matt a uh, quick question for me what's what sort of time period are you looking for the strategy to cover is that aligning with the, the local plan period or is it slightly different I th that's something i'm going to ho hopefully draw richard into the conversation if richard's still on the line because i i don't have that uh, that information to hand good afternoon <clears throat> sorry good afternoon, good afternoon Thanks, richard yeah. um it's it's not um we haven't actually picked a definite end date i think what we've got is we've got some tar we've got different kinds of um uh targets and end dates obviously the greater Norwich local plan has 2038 um government has set carbon reduction targets of various sorts for 2050 and 2035 i think what we want to do is put in place something that's long term to help us achieve those things so actually you've got to look at this as setting a long-term direction of travel, which will set, set in train a, a, a number of short, medium and longer term actions to meet those things. So uh, just kind of, we haven't, I, I suppose, so, so the, short, the short answer is there isn't a stipulated end date. And I think what we might well do is that the policies are, are shaped to kind of reach some of those longer term targets that we've been set, particularly those challenging ones around um, zero carbon. OK, thank, thank you for that, Richard. That may be something you want to consider is the time period. I, I guess where I'm coming from that is, is picking up on Mike's point is that may drive some of the priorities around the themes and also um, may expand other themes as we move forwards into uh, a, a brand new world beyond COVID, hopefully, and um, with technology changes and, and the likelihood of um, electricity and possibly hydrogen coming forward as, as some of the major aspects of, of being used within our transport system. So uh, there's a whole host of things there that uh, just wondering what is or isn't in scope, but it sounds like most things are going to end up in scope from what you've uh, just said. Okay, Barry, over to you. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate some of the, and, and agree with some of the comments that have been made by, by Mike and, and Matt in particular. Uh, the Transforming Cities Fund has achieved 
a great deal of um, improvement to uh, renewable transport. And we are constantly given compliments from government on the quality and the speed at which we are uh, actually starting these projects and getting them moving and completed. The fact that we've disrupted a lot of transport around Norwich over the last sort of couple of years is testament to that, that they've been as quick as possible and they've been as effective as possible. And each one of those projects has, generally speaking, worked around three themes, uh, improving and um, confirming the uh, timing for buses and ease of use of that kind of that mode of transport uh, so that there's reliability. Uh, cycling and pedestrianisation has also have also been uh, highlighted there on those those projects, as well as maintaining the the ability for motorists to be able to move around the city as and when required as well. But so, to some extent, by having reliable bus a bus pro, uh, program, uh, we also hope to encourage some people to use park and ride and, and not come into the city by car anyway. But overall. Quite disruptive, but very successful. And uh, I think the government has, has said that to us, that they've been very, it's working very well. Uh, and that will continue for some time yet and, um, uh, and should sort of lead to one of the major issues, which of course is climate uh, um, reduction in CO2 use and various other sort of climate issues that we, are also relevant to the work that's being done by the time. time Transforming Cities Fund. But yeah, otherwise, I totally agree with what Matt was saying. Okay, thank you, Barry. Thank you for uh, confirming your, your support with what uh, Matt was saying. Um, are there any other questions or comments to pick up? Can't see any. Okay, so we have the recommendation at the top of page 74 four to note the form and progress on development of the strategy and endorse the approach to developing the transport for Norwich strategy. Um, all those in favor? Okay, that looks, to be unanimous looks like everybody, any, I can see. anybody against? No, so there's no dissent. So we'll take that through. Thank you everybody for doing that. That brings us to the end of today's agenda um again just like to pick up on something that was said earlier just like to thank the the officer teams in all of the different areas and locations for their work in pulling together all of the the reports today um and for especially getting us uh, that bit closer to the submission of the local plan so thank you for that um i'll close the meeting thank you everybody for your participation. Please stay safe and look after yourselves out there. Take care.